gives me great pleasure in welcoming you to this webinar this evening. Epilepsy, as many of you know, I'm sure, is a condition where an individual is prone to recurrent epileptic seizures. An epileptic seizure, the change in movement or behaviour, the direct result of a change in the electrical activity of the brain. But epilepsy is not a single condition. It's a symptom. An epileptic seizure is a symptom. And there are many different causes, and more accurately, we refer to them as the epilepsies rather than epilepsy alone. This said, of course, the ability for an individual to participate in physical activity may vary according to how the epilepsy affects them. But there are also many misperceptions about the role of exercise in um, contributing perhaps to problems in those with epilepsy or even inducing seizures. This can lead to limitations in day-to-day -day activity in an individual with epilepsy. The role of the study about which the results you're about to hear, physical activity in childhood epilepsy or the PACE study, was to try and examine the degree of activity um, epilepsy, uh, individuals with epilepsy could, or children with epilepsy could undertook relative to perhaps their peers. And also to look at the barriers and facilitators that there may be in an individual participating in physical activity. The speakers, um, uh, Colin Riley and Natalie Pearson, were the investigators on the study. And so they are going to give talks to highlight the results. We're then going to hear a little later from individuals who've had personal experience and give their perspective on uh, uh, participating in sport and physical activity alongside having epilepsy. So with no further ado, I'll hand back to Lara and she can introduce our speakers. Thanks, Helen. So I'm now gonna pass over to our first speaker for this, e for this evening, Dr. Natalie Pearson, who is a senior lecturer at, in behavioral epidemiology at the University of Loughborough. And as Helen said, one of the lead researchers on the PACE project. Hi everyone, my name is Dr Natalie Pearson and I'm a senior lecturer in behavioural epidemiology at Loughborough University. And I'm really excited to talk to you this evening about a case control study looking at accelerometer and survey assessed physical activity in children with epilepsy. So before I begin, I wanted to provide a definition for physical activity because I'm going to say physical activity an awful lot throughout this talk. So the traditional definition of physical activity is any bodily movement produced by skeletal muscle that results in energy expenditure. More recently, um, Joe Piggin has come up with an all-encompassing definition of physical activity, and that is people moving, acting and performing within culturally specific spaces and contexts and influenced by a unique array of interests, emotions, ideas, instructions and relationships. So when I'm talking about physical activity, that is what I'm referring to today, people moving, acting or performing. So I'm going to just start with a bit of background um, to the study to provide a rationale. So children and adolescents and those aged 5 to 17 years should do at least an average of 60 minutes per day of moderate to vigorous intensity, mostly aerobic physical activity across a week. Moderate to vigorous um, physical activity is the kind of physical activity that makes you want to breathe a little harder and gets your heart rate up a little. And this should also incorporate um, vigorous intensity aerobic activities, as well as those that strengthen muscle and bone on at least three days a week. And this is just an infographic of the physical activity recommendations or the physical activity guidelines produced by the UK Chief Medical Officer. The guidelines that we have in the UK are the same um, advocated by the WHO or the World Health Organization. And we advocate for physical activity because of an array of reasons. Um, being physically active maintains a healthy weight, improves sleep, it makes you feel good, it improves health and fitness, it can strengthen muscle and bones, improves concentration and learning, develops coordination and builds confidence and social skills. And um, there are many, many more reasons to be physically active. 
But despite the beneficial effects of physical activity, data in the UK suggests that 40% of young people don't meet the minimum recommendations for physical activity. With many young people spending prolonged periods of time sedentary, and when I'm talking about sedentary, I'm referring to um, the behaviours where you're sitting, so sitting at school or sitting to watch television, for example. And evidence um, from across the world suggests that more than 80% of adolescents are physically inactive. And when I mean, um, what I mean by inactive is that they're not meeting that minimum um, 60 minutes per day of moderate to vigorous physical activity. So more than 80% of adolescents worldwide aren't meeting the physical activity recommendations. Physical inactivity is a leading risk for global mortality and contributes substantially to, deep, to disease and economic burden worldwide. And low levels of physical activity are of particular concern for children living with chronic medical conditions such as epilepsy. So children um, with epilepsy. So self or parent reported data suggests that children with epilepsy engage in significantly less physical activity than their peers without epilepsy. Children with epilepsy are often subjected to restrictions on physical activity participation because of a number of reasons, including parental concerns about injury, concerns about safety in relation to the occurrence of seizures, and a lack of understanding from parents, children, teachers, clinicians, coaches, and all other um, carers or caregivers of children on the benefits and risks associated with physical activity participation. And all of these things and many more of these reasons increase the risk of socialisation and have a detrimental impact on levels of physical activity in children with epilepsy. Evidence suggests that children with epilepsy who are physically inactive have a poorer physiological and psychological profile compared to those with, with epilepsy who are active, putting them at greater risk of long-term comorbidities and poor functioning. The physical activity could play an important role in improving the quality of life and social integration of children with epilepsy. However, to better understand physical activity levels and the outcomes associated with physical activity among children with epilepsy, so that physical activity can be promoted um, safely, it's essential for us to be able to accurately measure physical activity. To date, few studies have utilised more objective devices, such as accelerometers, to assess physical activity among children with epilepsy. Indeed, much of the evidence that we have so far on um, physical activity in children with epilepsy comes from either parent reporting of their children's physical activity levels or children with epilepsy reporting on their own behaviours. Now, studies have shown that pedometers are feasible um, to assess step counts among children with epilepsy, but to date there are no studies utilising accelerometers or these objective devices for physical activity. Accelerometers are able to provide more robust and detailed information on time spent in different intensities of physical activity. So this um, background that I've just given really provides the rationale for the PACE study or the physical activity in children with epilepsy study. And the aims of this study were to conduct a pilot study to compare physical activity levels of adolescents age 11 to 15 years with and without epilepsy using survey methods and also using wearable activity monitors or accelerometers. Other aims um, included the, um, us being able to identify possible factors associated with levels of physical activity, parental and young people um, views on barriers and facilitators to physical activity, and to explore views on the feasibility of conducting a pilot intervention study to increase physical activity in adolescents with epilepsy. So the study was put on hold um, in March 2020 because of COVID. So we ended up having to COVID proof pace, um, whereby a lot of the um, data collection was due to be in person 
where researchers would go into um, the young people's houses um, to, to run through the questionnaires and all of the information and put on accelerometers. We had to move um, all assessments to be digital and we restarted the programme in March 2021, developing an online recruitment portal and we advertised using social media and contacts within the school assemblies. Um, and we also utilised hospital sites when they reopened um, in November 2021. And these are just some examples of the recruitment methods um, that we used to try and recruit children with epilepsy and controls into the PACE study. So to be able to collect um, physical activity data that's robust or accurately um, telling us of the physical activity levels and intensities of children. We asked um, all participants, so those with and without epilepsy, to wear an Axigraph accelerometer for seven days. These are pictures of the accelerometers and the bottom picture shows you how um, children with epilepsy and children without epilepsy were asked to wear the accelerometer. We included data um, in these descriptive analyses that I'm going to share with you today, if participants wore these accelerometers for more than eight hours a day on at least one day. The young people in both groups um, also completed a physical activity questionnaire. So they reported on their physical activity levels in different contexts and also um, completed an adapted version of the adolescent sedentary activity questionnaire. Um, the data has been explored to look at physical activity levels in young people with epilepsy and those without epilepsy. And I'm going to, to just share with you some descriptive data on um, how often the accelerometers were worn and the total minutes um, of time spent sedentary in light physical activity and moderate to vigorous physical activity. So weekday accelerometer data were available for 51 children with epilepsy and 38 controls and weekend day accelerometer data were available for 47 children with epilepsy and 33 controls. So you can see that um, children with and without epilepsy wore the monitors slightly less on weekend days. But compliance with wearing the accelerometer was actually really good across both groups of young people. Um, with an average valid days were around five and a half days for both groups, meaning that children wore the accelerometer for around five and a half days. And as you can see from the table there, children um, with and without epilepsy wore um, the accelerometer for about 13 hours on weekdays and wore the accelerometer slightly less on weekend days. So this graph um, shows how much time children with epilepsy and control children were spending sedentary. And this is um, not quite an accurate measure of sitting, but um, it's the most accurate measure of sitting we've got from the accelerometers. And you can see that children with epilepsy spent almost 10 hours a day sedentary on weekdays and just over eight and a half hours on weekend days. Controls were slightly less sedentary during the week, but not, there wasn't much difference between the two groups for sedentary time. This graph shows um, time spent in light physical activity, and light physical activity is um, when you're kind of up on your feet and you're ambulating around, so just you know slowly moving perhaps around your kitchen to make some food, it doesn't um, require you to be out of breath or um, increase your heart rate very much. And you can see that children with epilepsy spent around three hours a day in light physical activity on weekdays, with control children spending significantly more time in light, closer to around four hours on weekdays. And the star there above the blue um, bar shows that there is a significant difference between time spent in light physical activity between children with epilepsy and controls. And this third graph shows the time spent in moderate to vigorous physical activity. And you'll remember from my first um, slides that moderate to vigorous physical activity is what is recommended 
by the, the government and the World Health Organization. And you can see that on weekdays, children with epilepsy spent approximately 35 minutes in moderate to vigorous physical activity, with control spending almost 10 minutes more in moderate to vigorous physical activity. And this difference was significant, which is why you can see the star above the blue chart um, there. On weekend days, the difference was only a few minutes. But I want you to just note here that neither the control children or the children with epilepsy were meeting the recommended minimum amount of 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity. So we also collected um, self-report physical activity and this allowed us to gain some contextual information on when um, and where perhaps the children were being um, physically active during the day. Now, children with epilepsy reported less physical activity than control children and children with epilepsy reported less physical activity specifically for active travel to school. So children with epilepsy were um, actively traveling less to schools and controls. They were less active during PE lessons uh, in school and they were less actively traveling home from school. We also collected self-report um, data on sedentary behaviour using the Adolescent Sedentary Activity Questionnaire. And this was designed to measure the type, frequency and duration of sedentary behaviour in adolescents outside of school hours. And participants were asked to report how long they spent engaged in each of the behaviours you'll see listed there before and after school on each day of the week and on each day of the weekend during a typical week. So we collected data across these five different domains, small screen recreation, um, being sedentary to do homework or education, sedentary for travel or cultural reasons, and um, being sedentary for social activities, such as sitting with friends. Now, there were no differences between groups um, statistically, but children with epilepsy did spend, um, sig spend longer on screen-related sedentary behaviours and total reported sedentary behaviour on weekdays and weekend days. Now this brings me to my final slide. So what are the next steps for physical activity in children with epilepsy? So the PACE study was the first study to actively measure physical activity using um, objective devices, so accelerometers. And we found that children with epilepsy um, are less physically active than controls and um, spend less time in light. And if we go on the reported um, sedentary behaviour, there is a tendency for children with epilepsy to report spending more time um, sitting than children um, without epilepsy. However, we need further studies to examine physical activity levels in more young people with epilepsy. We need to know more about physical activity in younger children with epilepsy. So this study collected um, information on younger adolescents, but we don't know a huge amount about physical activity in primary school aged children, for example. We also need to understand carers and caregivers views and concerns around physical activity in children with epilepsy. And we need to co-develop interventions to increase physical activity in children with epilepsy. And we need to do all of this so that we can make a difference to the lives of children with epilepsy through physical activity. It was my pleasure to talk to you today. Um, if you've got any questions, please reach out to me. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. Um, this final slide just shows the PACE team. Uh, and thank you very much to, to the big team. Um, enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thanks so much for that, Natalie. So I'm now going to pass over to Dr. Colin Riley, who is an educational psychologist at Young Epilepsy and another of the lead researchers on the PACE project. And just a quick note to remember, if you do have any questions, please do pop them in the Q&A at the bottom and then we can pose them to the researchers at the end. Hi everyone, uh, thank you very much Lara. Um, the title of my talk is 
one size does not fit all barriers and facilitators of physical activity in children with epilepsy. So as part of the PACE study, we also asked young people, caregivers, uh, young people and caregivers with epilepsy and also uh, young people in the control group and their caregivers about what they perceive to be uh, in terms of barriers and facilitators of physical activity uh, in children with epilepsy. The title one size does not fit all highlights the need uh, for often for activities to be tailored to the needs of young people uh, with epilepsy. So having knowledge of epilepsy and also uh, having the flexibility to adapt activities for young people with epilepsy. The background to the study is that um, people with epilepsy have often been discouraged by health professionals from participating in physical activity uh, due to concerns about physical activity leading to seizures and thus injury. But there's actually no evidence to suggest that physical activity actually increases seizure, seizure frequency uh, for the vast majority of individuals with epilepsy. And due to the benefits, uh, so the physiological and psychological benefits of uh, physical activity, the International League Against Epilepsy emphasised the importance of physical activity for people with epilepsy and argues that few sports should be off limits for such individuals, provided an appropriate individualised risk assessment has been carried out. Despite this, uh, and as Natalie has, has shown, young people with epilepsy engage in lower levels of physical activity uh, than peers without epilepsy. And it's really, really important then for us to understand what barriers exist to participation in physical act activity for young people with epilepsy and what supports uh, could increase their engagement in physical activity. So the objective and method for this part of the study was to explore young people and caregiver views regarding the barriers to and facilitators of physical activity in children with epilepsy. So we wanted to hear about the barriers but also possible supports that might help young people with physical activity uh, engage, or young people with epilepsy engage in physical activity. Participants and their parents were asked open questions in a survey about barriers and facilitators and here are examples of some of the questions. What do you think may stop children and young people with epilepsy engaging in physical activity? And what do you think might support children and young people uh, with epilepsy engaging in physical activity? And the responses uh, to the questions uh, were analysed using thematic analysis. So that this involves reading through all the responses reading through all the data and looking for patterns and meaning in the data. So if, if a particular topic is mentioned quite often, that might be a particular theme. So if, for example, fear of seizures during physical activity was mentioned, that might be a theme. And also in terms of teams, we may have sub teams associated with those teams. And I'll go into that a little bit later. Our participants, as in uh, the, the broader PACE study, were school aged children with epilepsy living in England. Uh, we recruited the children um, uh, via hospitals and also via social media platforms. Uh, the, epi the epilepsy diagnosis was confirmed by GPs or paediatricians and controls uh, were matched on age, gender and socioeconomic status with the epilepsy, epilepsy participants. So for this part of the study, 41 uh, children or young people with epilepsy responded and 35 controls. And in terms of caregivers, it was 60 caregivers of children with epilepsy and 31 caregivers uh, in the control group. So what barriers came up when we asked uh, young people and caregivers about, uh, you know, what, what, what might stop young people with epilepsy engaging in physical activity? And here is a table with the main uh, teams and sub teams. The first one here is seizure safety. So this is about the risk of injury due to seizures uh, in, uh, during physical activity and also the need for additional supervision uh, to, to, to watch the child or to monitor the child in case they have seizures. Another team that came up was anxiety about having a seizure. So this is about a fear of having a seizure during physical activity, which might lead to young people not wanting to take part, fear that physical activity may actually trigger a seizure, uh, and also a general lack of lack of self-confidence due to, you know, that anxiety about having a seizure. Uh, respondents also brought up 
the stigma and negative attitudes associated with having epilepsy. So epilepsy is unfortunately often associated with stigma. Uh, so that can be embarrassment about having uh, epilepsy. Uh, so just fear about the public perception about having uh, epilepsy as a diagnosis. Uh, they can be negative attitudes from peers, but also from adults. And in general, they can be a fear of seizures from coaches, peers, and even teachers in school. Tiredness may also be a barrier, uh, tiredness due to seizures and tired, tiredness due to the uh, side effects of medication. Uh, lack of knowledge. Uh, there was also a concern or, or a, a view that a barrier was that many coaches, teachers did not have enough knowledge of epilepsy and this hindered participation of the young person with epilepsy. And one thing that came up from predominantly from the parents of young people with epilepsy was that sometimes children with epilepsy have uh, poor coordination and they, that may uh, dissuade them from wanting to engage in uh, physical activity or join uh, sport clubs as they may feel embarrassed about their lack of physical uh, coordination uh, or lack of physical competence. Just to give you an idea of some of the, the things that young people uh, and their caregivers wrote, uh, the young people with epilepsy, uh, here are some uh, uh, quotes or citations. People worry you are going to overdo it and have a seizure, so coaches are reluctant to let you do too much. Sports coaches not having an understanding of the impact of epilepsy and how to deal with seizures, so this is a bar another barrier. And having seizures makes you very tired, which means you don't have the energy to engage in physical activity. Uh, so a young person feeling that that fatigue or tiredness associated with epilepsy may be a barrier to engaging in physical activity. So in terms of supports, what did the young people and the caregivers feel would be helpful in terms of facilitating uh, participation in physical activity for young people with epilepsy? Uh, a key team here is improving knowledge about epilepsy and its management. So that's knowledge about seizure management, that understanding that fatigue is often up associated with epilepsy and the need to undertake risk assessments. So what is the risk here uh, for the child if they participate in physical activity? Maybe the risk is not that great at all. And in the majority of cases, as I said, uh, once a proper risk assessment is undertaken, the child can uh, take part in physical activity, the child with epilepsy. Another theme was about, uh, I suppose, the general view that attitudes towards epilepsy in society are often negative and there needs to be better perception of epilepsy in society, better representation, uh, and this may reduce the stigma or negative attitudes associated with epilepsy. Uh, it's important to increase encouragement for young people uh, to engage uh, in physical, young people with epilepsy to engage in physical activity, and was also a desire for more sporting, mo sporting role models. So individuals individuals um, with uh, epilepsy who engage in sport and uh, you know we're going to hear from AJ Boothroyd, a professional footballer uh, who shows that you know engaging in high level professional sport is possible even if you have epilepsy. Another theme is the, is the need to really tailor activities and the environment. So to have flexibility in the actual uh, physical activity uh, sessions. Uh, for example, the young person with epilepsy might need more breaks. Uh, there's a need for adequate supervision uh, during the activity. Uh, so adults, adult supervision, so the young person with epilepsy can participate without having fear of having a seizure. And also in terms of inclusion of all abilities. Uh, so regardless of the child's uh, physical abilities, they're, they're actually included in the activity. Uh, the young people and the caregivers uh, also feel that young people with epilepsy may benefit from peer support groups. So this could be support groups where young people with epilepsy can engage in physical activity uh, together. And just some citations to give a bit of uh, a flavour of, of what young people um, and their caregivers uh, said to us in relation to supports. Um, this young person felt that teachers and peers need to have a level of understanding uh, that the person isn't actually, uh, the person is tired and isn't actually just being uh, lazy. Uh, this young person felt it's very important to make sure that grown-ups know what to do in an emergency. So if a seizure happens, it's very important that adults in the environment understand uh, what to do. 
and uh, a parent of a young person with ep epilepsy emphasised the need for more role models in the sporting world who are open about having uh, epilepsy. So just to summarise in terms of barriers and, and supports or facilitators for physical activity uh, in terms of, of young people with epilepsy, you know, what is the issue and what do we need to do? Um, so it's important to say that, you know, views regarding barriers to physical activity really highlight there's much to be done still in terms of uh, supporting young people with epilepsy's participation in physical activity. Fears about limited knowledge of epilepsy and seizure management need to be addressed via training and educational activities. So there needs to be training and activity and educational activities available to those involved in sporting organisations and in schools so that young people uh, can participate uh, in uh, physical activity uh, in a safe way. Many of our respondents felt that epilepsy is associated with stigma and negative attitudes, and this is often a barrier to participation. So really, there's still work to be done at a societal level to reduce the stigma associated with epilepsy. And in terms of the supports, uh, how can we help young people with epilepsy engage uh, in physical activities? Uh, there is a need to think about how can one tailor those activities. So perhaps there's a need to build in, to build in uh, breaks. Uh, peer support for young people with epilepsy can meet other young people with epilepsy uh, is important. And also, you know, that there would be more role models, some more, uh, you know, role models who are engaging in sport, for example, at a high level, uh, you know, role models with epilepsy. And I think this can really show that people with epilepsy can actively participate in physical activity and even uh, high level sport. I want to just finish up by sincerely thanking uh, a number of people, particularly all our participants, uh, the young people with epilepsy, their caregivers, but also the young people uh, and caregivers in the control group, uh, the PACE team, uh, the names here on the left, and also the participating uh, NHS trusts, uh, Luckbury University and uh, the Waterloo Foundation, uh, who were the funders for the project. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for that, Colin. I think it's really great to hear about some of the ways that we can support young people to engage in more physical activity. And as Colin said, one of those is by increasing the visibility of sporting role models. And so with that in mind, I'm really excited to introduce our next speaker, Jay Bothride. Jay Bothride is a former professional footballer who had a long and successful career playing for the likes of Arsenal and Coventry City, as well as for the England national team. Jay unfortunately can't be with us this evening, so what we're going to share is a pre-recorded interview where Jay shares some of his experiences of epilepsy within professional sport. Can you explain a little bit about your epilepsy journey? Yeah, so for me, I think mine was a little bit different. Um, I realised I had epilepsy in my teens. And did you, um, in terms of like your, your professional athlete, did you? How did you feel about telling your coaches, your teammates? Yeah, well, this is the thing. Like, I, I never felt 100% comfortable speaking about it. Because in football, when you go and sign a contract, you're signing like two, three, four year contracts. And I honestly felt that if I had have told them my condition before I put pen to paper, it might change that contract. Because uh, they might look at me as a liability. You know, because, for example, if the doctor said, oh, he's never able to play football again, but I've got a four-year contract, they're still going to have to pay me for four years, which the clubs won't want to do. So for me, I, I never told them I had, uh, I had epilepsy until I had signed. Wow. Then I would go to the doctor and say, listen, I, you know, I forgot to mention it before, but I do have epilepsy. It's not like I'm not going to have a seizure from looking at lights or anything like that but I felt I need to tell you that I have it so I would always speak to my physio mm -hmm. but obviously because it's my physio it's confidential right yeah so it's not like the club wouldn't know me and him know um, and that's the way I that's the way I would manage it throughout my career 
And did you ever feel that your epilepsy was a, a barrier to you, your performance? Any anything that came off the back of that? Any no um, but, things that associated with it that, that affected you? No, I didn't see it as a barrier because for me, my personality is very much like you know, I was always that kid. If you told me you can't do something, I want to do it. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of the way my my life has been, my career has been, um, and I never. In my mind, I just thought, I'm going to achieve my dreams. I, I, you know, I'm not, wherever the circumstances are, I'm going to do what I want to do. Um, and, and that's the way I live my life. That's the way I live my career. Um, there were times in my career where I didn't feel good. I mean, I was just speaking to a friend recently, actually, about a seizure that I had. And he said to me, I had a seizure um, two days before we played the game against Arsenal. And I still went out and played. And like, really, just, that's nothing you shouldn't do. Yeah. Um, because your body is exhausted. You know, it takes time to, you know, to start feeling better again. But for me, again, it was just, I want to play. I love the game. I'm going to go out there and, and do what I want to do. And again, it, it's dangerous to do that. Um, and it's not what I would advise um, but that's just what I did because I was so mentally tough and you know my Turned tunnel vision focused, turn, yeah, yeah. focused um, so I would go out and play games like that where I wasn't 100% there, there were some times where as you get going you start feeling better but then there were some games where I felt like just exhausted, completely exhausted but even at that point, it was like, I don't even want to tell the manager because I still want to play. Of course. You know? Um, but yeah, I dealt with that quite often in my career. Um, there's another example. I remember we went away on pre-season training and we was in Portugal. And the manager said, you know, on the first night you can go out and have a few drinks with the team. Um, and then, you know, we start training tomorrow afternoon so you know we went out and I'm not a big drinker anyway um, but it was a late night and I got back in at like 3 or something in the morning and then we went training at like 12 and I remember I trained like well I felt really good in the training session but then when I was walking home back to the, the, the hotel I blacked out on a car and it like singed all my skin on my arm here and actually, I've still got it. Like, it's a scar there on my leg. Yeah. It was lucky I didn't put my face down. But yeah, and then the ambulance came and took me to the hospital. Went to the hospital and they you know, put that like gauze on oh, yeah, my yeah, arm. Yeah. And then I get up, like pre season game, I played like the next day. But I would do things like that. And again, I have to reiterate you shouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, 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 it's not healthy and it's not right. You have to take care of yourself. Um, but I wanted to fight odds. Mm. I wanted to just do what I loved doing. That's how much I loved football. That's how much I was determined. Because the way I look at it is, if in the world of football, if you let someone, if you give someone else an opportunity, it might be your last opportunity. As in, someone will take my spot. And I didn't want to give someone the opportunity to take my spot. So I would always push, yourself push myself to the <clears throat> limitations. Um, and that happened throughout my career. Now when I look back, I always say to the youngsters and any, anyone in any walk of life, but especially sport, whatever strain of epilepsy you have, you have to find out about that first and what you're capable of. But still, you can still achieve all your dreams once you know about yourself. Um, so for me, I always want to say to the younger generation, you know, always be positive. Don't look at our condition as a negative. We just have a condition. But you can still live with it, you can still achieve your dreams, and you can still move forward in life and be successful. I don't like it when I hear people, you know, can I say, oh, you know, that illness yeah. for epilepsy, to me, that's you know that upsets me. That gives me a bad feeling. That's derogatory. Yeah, it's a it's a condition like any other condition. 
but you learn to live with these conditions. You know, it's not stopping you. It's just, you know, it might hinder you now and again, but it doesn't stop you. It doesn't have to stop you. And is there anything you've seen sort of in terms of the participation in sport for young people with epilepsy that you think that needs to change, that we need to do more? Time? There definitely needs to be more awareness. Yeah. That goes without saying. Um, and, you know, hopefully people like me that is speaking out now about epilepsy and about, you know, me having it and me having a full career um, with this condition, um, hopefully it will put a, a more positive message out there, but also to the football clubs or tennis clubs or, or whatever, you know, they need to understand how to deal with a person that has epilepsy and understand that that person with epilepsy can still achieve his potential or her potential in life and be successful. Thanks so much for that, Jay. Really fantastic to hear from someone with such a successful career in professional sport. I think a really important message to finish there that we really need to raise awareness within sporting ex organisations about epilepsy and how it can be managed to allow young people with epilepsy to go on to achieve their ambitions. And on that note, I'm delighted to introduce two members of our Youth Voice Network to finish our presentations this evening. We're going to hear from both Beth and Ronell, who are allowed to introduce themselves. But Beth is actually on the call with us this evening. So if you have any questions for her, please do feel free to put them in the Q&A. Hi, Yeah, my name is Ronell. Uh, I'm 23. Um, yeah, from from London. And a bit about my epilepsy journey is that um, I was diagnosed when I was 18, and at that time I was playing football at quite a high level. Um, and yeah, a bit more about my epilepsy is that it's caused by it's caused by a brain tumor. It's, it's controlled now, but. Um, Back then, when I, when I was playing football, um, yeah, it, it wasn't controlled and everything was a bit up in the air and I had a lot, a lot of doubts about whether, whether I could play again, um, yeah. Um, I'm Bethany, I'm 18, um, I'm from Northern Ireland and I was actually diagnosed when I was two. Um, I've generalised epilepsy and then I also have hydrocephalus, so fluid in my brain, which also causes seizures, so I get double whammy. Um. <laughs> yeah, um, definitely for me was the main one was can I play football again? Um, you know, football was my kind of like identity. So yeah, when I had um, when I got when I got the diagnosis, I, I was quite isolated, um, felt really anxious. Um, yeah, I, I didn't know. I didn't know what to do with my life, and I, I didn't know who I could go to. And yeah, I just wasn't sure where where it was going to put me if I was even allowed to play football. So yeah. Uh, well, I was really young when I got diagnosed, so I mean, a two year old didn't really have any thoughts. Um, but like my worries only really started when I like went to secondary school and stuff, and like started doing sports. Um, and then like when I started uni this year and stuff, and like having to disclose it to people and all, I'm like. Because I'm doing education, it's a little bit, you have to kind of disclose everything. So that's like a little bit of worry, like just because people kind of look down on you. But yeah, mine didn't really start until like teenage years. I just thought at first I'd have to change my whole like career path and yeah, what I can do in life. But it would really like, stop me from from doing anything um which obviously wasn't the case but yeah that was my first thought i wouldn't be able to do anything uh yeah well i don't know if like mainland uk is different but like over here no one really knows anything about epilepsy like it's not very talked about over here like i actually had to like explain my diagnosis to one of my teachers um she was very confused and i me 12 years old trying to explain it to a grown adult was very very weird um but like 
sports and stuff like a lot of people were like oh you can't do it you can't do it like just with no understanding like it can be controlled and stuff they just heard the word epilepsy and was just like no so yeah no that was like the first thing i did because I, I knew obviously like health comes first so the first thing i did was disclose it um to my te- yeah to my teammates and my coaches um I, I think at first like the way they reacted um was good they wanted to give me like all the help and then i think also they were a bit they were a bit scared as well and i think i think the thing around like i don't know sports and epilepsy and it's just i feel like there's not enough like like you were saying Beth like a lot of people don't know um about it which is the problem and then it can kind of stop it can kind of stop you from doing things or they might just stop you from doing everything because they don't know anything about it but if they knew more about it then you know you'd you'd be able to take part in different things yeah without them feeling a certain type of way um well like when I was younger like obviously my parents told them because like I was a child so like it was kind of like on them but um like as I got older it's not that I didn't tell them I just kind of under undermined it a little and made it less <laughs> less <laughs> to I was like oh it's it's fine like I just kind of like made it like less severe to them and that kind of like because like when my parents like explained it, like I was not allowed to do like any of the stuff. So I kind of like learned and I kind of was like, I have epilepsy, but it's fine. Like that's kind of how I went about it. But um, it was always kind of awkward disclosing it because like they kind of just looked at you like, but like it kind of, like I didn't not disclose it. I just undermined it a little. Yeah, no, there was definitely one time I felt like I experienced like something was when um, uh, we were going to play like another team and the manager came to me and said, oh, you can't play. There's not there's not going to be a physio there. But really and truly, you know, I could play. <laughs> I was given the all clear from my like from my neurologist. Um, and I don't, I, don't feel, I don't feel like it's something there like you need the physio to be there constantly checking me, you know, and I felt that that made me feel that, like that made me feel isolated and that, that didn't make me feel, yeah, it didn't, it didn't give me a nice feeling and I, I didn't, I did, like, I don't want, want anyone else to ever like get that feeling, you know, and I may, and I know he, he like, he may have been doing it out of, you know, my safety, but it, you know, the way it made me feel wasn't, yeah, it wasn't nice. Yeah, so I did gymnastics from when I was five until I was 13. Um, and like up until like nine years old, it was all sweet. Like, it was all grand. Uh, no one, like they knew about it, but like they like knew that I could like do certain things. And if I had a seizure, I had a seizure. Um, but we got like a new like manager of the gym and she like came in and she was like going through all the files and she was like, why is this girl here? Why is she? And like I literally like um they were literally like no she can't do it like she can't do it like my parents were like she can like she can do it fine um and all my other coaches were like we've known she was five she's perfectly like she's okay to do it and she was like no I don't want her on the team and stuff so like I like got taken off the team for a certain bit of time <laughs> and then I had to like bring in like all these like literally like a whole file of like my doctor's notes being like she's fine to do it and like it was just kind of like the fact that I had to like prove that I could do it when all my coaches knew I could do it like my parents were saying I could do it I was saying I could do it and this person that had literally met me for like two seconds was like no mm-hmm. she didn't even come to me and like ask she just like automatically like assumed I couldn't do it. So yeah, it like, it made me like feel really like insecure about my epilepsy and stuff being like, oh, well, if this person's never met me and she's saying this like about me, maybe I can't do it. And then like, I got into like a pattern of like being like, I can't do it. Like anytime people would have been going to do it. And I was like, no, nope, I can't, I can't. Because like so many people had told me that I couldn't do it, so. Yeah, 
Yeah, um, I think for me, and I say it all the time, but like obviously reaching out to like services like Young Epilepsy. Um, so especially like when I did that, um, I got to speak to football players in my position who had epilepsy, who were playing football at even higher level than me, which it showed me that, you know, I can do things when people were saying, no, you can't do this. Um, and also even like reaching out to uh, Alex, who's the uh, is a support worker at Young Epilepsy, um, who I'd go and see and ha have chats with. And he actually came down to my football team and he did a presentation with the players. And he also did one with the coaches too, which I think it was, it was really good from him. And it was um, really like lovely from my, uh, my, my team that they wanted to learn more and, you know, uh, yeah, learn more about epilepsy and how to deal with it. And, you know, I think that's what needs to happen at other places, you know, not just with, not just with me, but, you know, I don't know, there's people in like worse situations, not being able to do things. And yeah, I just think that needs to happen everywhere, I think. And I, I feel like that's a, that's, a, that's a good step, I think. Um, well, I changed to dance when I was like, 13 years old um Irish dancing and like it was like the biggest like change of my life going from a different sport to a new sport as like a teenager when a lot of people would have started it like younger if you get me like not that you can't but like a lot of people would have started it younger so you would have like had to like catch up and stuff but honestly it was the best decision I ever made like my coaches and my teammates were all so supportive like there was no like barrier with like oh she has epilepsy will not put her into this like they didn't they, they just saw me as a dancer which was good and then like when i was 16 i went and won world so like that's just kind of like it kind of proves like you can do anything with epilepsy so like that was kind of like a big thing like winning it and then obviously i only joined like a couple months ago here but I didn't know anyone who had epilepsy growing up and then like joining it and like seeing all these like young people that are literally like just like me it was like it was really good so thanks so much Renal and Beth I think it's really sobering to hear about some of the barriers that you've faced, but also incredibly inspiring to hear about all of your successes. Um, so we're now going to move on to the Q&A section of the webinar. So I have a first question here. Um, so can physical activity actually help with reducing seizures or how else might it improve the young person's life? You want me to take that? Yeah, <laughs> you could. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it can help with well-being, and well-being and empowerment means that seizures can reduce. Um, but it will be an individual thing. There's no doubt that it is much better to be fit and well, and that gives you, you know, the whole sense of health and well-being. Um, and therefore less likely to have seizures than more likely to. So yes, there's no evidence that seizure, epilepsy or uh, seizures are provoked by physical activity, except in very isolated circumstances. And just to add to that, Helen, uh, we know that children with epilepsy are at higher risk of having, uh, you know, mental health problems. And we also know that engaging in physical activity can have a very positive impact on, on uh, you know, mood uh, and things like depression and anxiety. So that's another aspect which is so important. Absolutely. Thanks, Dave. Um, so another question here, what might you suggest to improve physical activity in children with epilepsy or what might an intervention look like? Natalie, I don't know if you want to take that one. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, can you, will you just repeat that, Laura? Yeah, Sorry, of course. Um, so it was, what might you suggest to improve physical activity in children with epilepsy or what might an intervention look like? Yeah, thank you. So kind of like what Helen was saying that when um, you're thinking about increasing physical activity or doing uh, more physical activity, if you've been particularly inactive or your child's been particularly in inactive, it's really important to talk to your um, paediatricians and um, the people who are providing care for your epilepsy. In terms of, um, you know, increasing things, you know, um, as I said in, in my um, presentation, things like 
um, actively walk into school, walking home from school, um, things like that that are particularly sort of socially normal um, will also help with things like mental health and feeling um, integrated, I suppose, into, into society. Um, and in terms of an intervention, um, that's kind of something that we're thinking about for our future research. And we'd be um, more sort of keen to co-develop these with children with young epilepsy rather than us as researchers and um, caregivers saying this is what an intervention should look like. We would really want to sort of develop that um, with children so that the children with epilepsy are actually telling us what an intervention should look like. Just on that, um, Lara, I think uh, both Bethany and Renel give really good examples of positive encouragement. Mm -hmm. uh, Renel gave the example of someone coming to talk to his team about epilepsy. And uh, Bethany, you gave a really good example when you started doing the, the dancing, that everybody was so positive and encouraging. And it's that type of inclusion, which I think really helps the young person feel that it's fine for me to be here and thus engage in physical activity or engage in particular sporting activity. Yeah, definitely. And there's actually a question here for you, Beth, which is kind of related, saying, what did your Irish dancing team slash group do to make your experience really positive? Um, I think it's more just that, like, when I said I had epilepsy, they didn't, like, make it about my epilepsy. Like, they understood I had epilepsy and they understood that, like, I can't have a seizure, but they, like, didn't see me as being less able to do it than anyone else because of my epilepsy so I think that's what really helped it because they didn't see it as a barrier than anything else yeah 100 percent. thanks Beth um so we also have a couple of questions about the side effects of epilepsy medication on sporting performance so has any research been done around the impact of epilepsy medication on sporting performance that we know of. You're muted, Helen. And to save you from my sneezing. Um, <laughs> the um, I know that there have been lots of studies looking at reaction times on some anti um, seizure medications, um, and it's some specific medications, maybe the more sedating ones like carbamazepine, that may have an effect on reaction times, but overall, it's not, um, and you know, yes, there may also be concerns amongst elite sportsmen about um, uh, um, interference with, you know, reducing performance. And I know that some have perhaps pe preferred to not, you know, try and manage their epilepsy because of the type of epilepsy they have without being on medication. But overall, you know, medication shouldn't have that degree of side effects that it's going to slow performance and therefore that needs to be discussed if there's concern about it. Colin, do you want to add an, or Natalie, do you want to add anything? I think I agree, Helen. I think if, if it seems that the medication is uh, impacting particularly on alertness or performance that's something that should be you know discussed with the with the child's or you know young person supporting a doctor just to make sure that you know maybe the medication might need to be adjusted for example um yeah i don't know much about the sort of medication side of it but the sort of i suppose the gist of what we were talking about today is about increasing physical activity and by physical activity, we're talking about just moving, whether it's walking or riding your bike, taking your dog for a walk, going to the park, taking part in PE. Um, we weren't talking about necessarily, you know, the fastest 100 meter sprint or um, playing football professionally, for example. Um, but anything you can do to help your children move more um, is kind of the message that we were kind of going for today. Definitely. Thanks, Natalie. Um, and then I think one final question. So there's a few questions about how best to approach schools or clubs to kind of how best to approach them about the epilepsy to kind of convince them that it's OK for their children to take part. I think information is key. Um, and I think, you know, it's really unfortunate that Bethany had such an unpleasant experience with regard to um, the gym, the gymnastics, because 
you know, actually that showed a degree of ignorance on the part of the coach rather than actually any problem. And therefore, you know, I'm going to discuss the case then, you know, with the offer of providing information, information about the individual, they may or may not be having seizures, you know, they may actually be completely controlled. I think providing the appropriate information is key rather than hiding it or not wanting to discuss it. Um, I'm going to add something. Um, I mentioned that I like didn't disclose it properly. I would not recommend that. Um, I actually think like as I got older, me explaining it to people made it a lot easier. Like coming from the person with epilepsy instead of hearing people's perspectives on it made it people understand a lot better. And Bethany, I think your response was entirely appropriate in the fact that you just wanted to get on with your life yeah. and not make a big thing of it, you know, and that's what happens. But unfortunately, we have to give this as you've got older, you've realised that explaining it makes it much easier. Um, and yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I think it's one thing um, explaining it. But when you live with epilepsy, you just got to get on with life. You've just got to do what, what you want to do and what you love to do. So it's, absolutely. Yeah. And not feel any different. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Fantastic. So I think that's a great place to finish. Before we do close for the evening, there's just one final thing I'd like to share with you. Thanks, Sasha. So as you've heard this evening, children and young people are unnecessarily excluded from opportunities to partake in physical activity. And at Young Epilepsy, we recognise that this is a common reoccurring theme across all aspects of their life because people don't understand epilepsy and how it can be different for everyone. To try and address this, we're launching a new campaign, which you can see on the screen, Understand My Epilepsy. And B is one of the young people who will be sharing her story over the coming weeks and months. So within this campaign, we're calling for every school across the UK to understand their students' epilepsy. And this means understanding their seizure type, their triggers, their medication side effects, the impact of their the impact on their mental health, and understanding. So then, that understanding of their individual epilepsy can help support them to be safe and included, so they can reach their full potential. So once this webinar concludes, in the coming days, we'll send across a pre-record a recording of the webinar for you to watch back if you'd like, and we'll also include some information about this campaign and how you can get involved. So we'd love to hear your thoughts. So please do get in touch with myself and the rest of the team at Young Epilepsy on that. If there isn't anything else, then thank you so much for attending and good night. Good night.